very pleased to welcome James Montaldi. And, um, well, share the screen, James, and let's see. Right, I'm going to try. Um, so I've got several things to share, and I'm going to, well, I've got most of them on my iPad. So I'm going to share my iPad and hope this works. Uh, right, actually, the so this is um, the title is slightly different, but that was just an oversight. I I forgot to edit it. Uh, I'd given this talk numerous times, but not for about five or no, more than that years, eight years or something. So this was work I published. I did with a PhD student, Katie Steckles, who some of you might have uh, come across based in the UK. So she works, since her PhD, she's been doing that most fantastic thing, which is public understanding of science or public understanding of mathematics. So she's been hosting, you know, these science fairs and things. She does demonstrations of why maths is such an interesting subject. And uh, she seems to be very good at it. And she talks to school kids and encourages them to, to, to do... Uh, mathematics stuff. She's been on, for those of you in, in, in England who probably know the TV show QI, so a comedy panel show, um, but she did a really nice demonstration of why one plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth sums up to two using beer. So she had a pint glass and a half pint glass and a quarter pint glass and so on, filled them up and put one inside another and so on. Anyway, look, She's now lecturing at uh, Sheffield Hallam. Um, so anyway, she was my PhD student. And um, so she did her PhD in, I guess, 2012. And we wrote this paper, which was published in 2013. And um, yeah, so I've given it lots of times. And this is a sort of adaptation. Each time I give it, I've uh, adapt adapted the, the file and I forgot to change the title into what it should have been for today, but um, anyway, it's approximately the same. Symmetries and braids, braids I think it was. So the, this uh, topic has several um, a, um, aspects to it. Um, so this is about the n-body problem in dynamical systems, which, which goes back to Newton and Kepler and people like that. So it's you take n particles or planets or whatever scale you think at and have them attract each other at gravitational, with a gravitational force. So inverse square law. And they uh, we're going to be assuming that the, the planets or the particles are all identical. So they have the same mass. So that's, as far as uh, astronomy goes, that's not very realistic, but... Um, Anyhow, and uh, so people were interested since Poincaré, people realized that uh, periodic motions are an important class of motion to understand. Everything else can be sort of related to, or, or, or they, they sort of act as organizing centers for, for what goes on. So even in the three body problem, which is famously a chaotic system, as, as Poincaré knew, uh, there were very few periodic motions known. So um, let me just see if I can switch. What? Oh. Let's have a new thing. So there were Lagrange. Uh, showed that if you take three particles, actually of any mass, but we're interested in three particles of identical mass. Uh, so the center of mass is at the or is at, at the center of the triangle. So that's an equilateral triangle, and you rotate them uniformly um, about the origin. Then that would be a solution to the three-body problem, which is obviously periodic because uh, the particles go round in a circle. Uh, Euler showed that if you take a straight line and 
Well, when they're equal masses, you you equally uh, you arrange them at equi equidistant, a sort of isosceles arrangement, and then and, and just rotate the line essentially. So just rotate it rigidly, then that's a, a solution to the problem. Okay, it's a bit obvious, um, but maybe it wasn't at the time. But actually, Lagrange and Euler did it for arbitrary masses, so it becomes less obvious. Uh, if the if the if the masses are different here, then you wouldn't it wouldn't be isosceles, but there would be a, a distribution of the three masses on the line, where if you, rotating the line gives you a solution. But um, as I said, we're interested in the equi, equal mass situation. Uh, so, but those were the only periodic solutions known uh, until the year 2000, essentially. Um, and in the year 2000, there was a paper written by Alain Chancunet from Paris and Richard Montgomery from California. which showed that there was a remarkable solution where the three bodies go around. Excuse me, I have very shaky hands, so my drawings are always not very good. So you take a figure eight, a nice smooth figure eight, that's supposed to be more symmetric than it looks, and you set them going around uh, a curve, this, fig this figure eight type curve, figure eight shape, uh, and that also forms a periodic solution. Um, so this particle will go to that one, to pass this one back again. Right. So the three follow each other around that same closed curve. And the way they prove it is not uh, by solving the differential equation, but by using um, uh, variational methods. So the principle is, uh, so I'm just saying some sort of background variational principles. So uh, some, some background context and, and uh, motivation for what I'm gonna talk about later. So, um, So they took, um, so if you think of periodic motions, so this is a, a closed curve in the space of configurations. So we could take the configuration space to be th three particles, or more generally n particles in the plane. So it's n points in the plane, but distinct points. So we're going to exclude the collisions. So we take, um, Let's, let's use complex numbers C n. So I think that's the notation used by people in configuration spaces to mean n copies of the plane without the diagonals. Um, so that's the configuration space. So a point in there would look like Z1 up to Zn. The, the cases above have n equals three. So that's n distinct particles. And they're moving it in, in, in as, as a function of time, and you want this to be a closed curve, so it's going to be periodic. So we assume we can fix the period. So we'll take period equals one. And so um, these, these positions, Z, so Z1, Z2, Z3, functions of time, and concatenating them in this way, we'll call this uh, gamma of t is z1 of t, etc. This is just the notation we're going to be using. So at each point t, there's some uh, configuration like this one. And uh, so they they that, so there's a if you think of the loop space. So think of all continuous maps. So T is, uh, period is one. So we think of it as a map gamma from 
R mod Z. S1 into this uh, space of configurations. So it's loop space, which all, all of you are familiar with, I'm sure, more than I am. Um, and uh, so associated to gamma is the action, which I won't define, but because it, um, it's not particularly interesting unless you're into mechanics, it's kinetic energy minus potential energy. Um, so A, A is a map, is a map from loop space, which we call it lambda CN, to R, which is in some sense smooth, um, twice differentiable. So uh, if you're an analyst, you have to worry about what sort of loops you mean. So some uh, differentiable natural one is uh, a particular sub -left space of loops but they're all homotopy equivalent. So as far as the topologist goes, it doesn't matter which, which one. You can take uh, continuous maps with um, give it the compact open topology uh, for the space, but the action function is only defined if they're differentiable. Uh, so, um, so the theorem is uh, that the variational principle is that uh, Gamma is a solution of the system if and only if it's a critical point. Of this action function. Excuse me, I've got a dog in here who wants to get out. So that's the basic setup, and uh, so how do they how do they analyze this and use the, uh, this variational principle to prove that, that there's a particular solution? And essentially, this is the argument that people have used in different cases. So they analyze um, the, this action functional on this set of maps well, when n is three. And you uh, you can prove that this has to have a minimum somewhere. Okay, it's a, a, a functional analytic property called coercivity. So you prove that it has to have a minimum somewhere. But what you don't know a priori is that that minimum doesn't involve collisions. And so that's where the work is. And what they what they do is they they um, Assume that the, your solution, your, your class of paths, they don't do it on the whole loop space here. They do it on a class of paths where there is some sort of symmetry. So there's a, a, a horizontal line of reflection. And this particular configuration, the point Z1 is, suppose this is time equals zero. Uh, it has a particular symmetry. An instant later, Z1's moved up and it doesn't have this reflectional symmetry anymore. But when T is zero, this configuration here, Z2 is permuted with Z3 and Z1 is fixed. So they use that as the start initial point and then they look at an endpoint, which is a different symmetric configuration. They minimize it. Uh, well, they know there's a minimum because of this coercivity property. And then secondarily, they analyze all the possible motions that have a collision in them. So if they've got a collision in them, they estimate, so some sort of typical analysis argument with inequalities and estimations, and they find a lower bound for the action when, um, when there's a collision involved. And then they find another path, an actual path written in coordinates, they find the the action is less than that potential minimum when they're on the, all the space of all collisions. So there's a non-collision one that has a lower action value than all the collision ones. And uh, so therefore the minimum, which is attained by this general property, uh, this minimum cannot have collisions. 
So that's the general argument that analysts use. Uh, and it's been repeated in very, for various other symmetric configurations. So that's the, that started off this whole um, uh, sequence of papers and theorems and things that different people proved. Um, so I'll show you, for those who haven't seen the, uh, the, the website that this guy produced, This is, um, this is the figure eight solution. Let's speed it up a bit. And uh, shortly after Chancina and Montgomery proved this, the natural thing to, for any mathematician to say is, well, we've got a nice figure eight with three particles on it. What about four particles? But if you put four particles on it, you're gonna get a collision. Because part of the, what's built into this is that the the particles are equally spaced going around the curve. So uh, a guy, Gerver, um, a year or two later, produced these, uh, this example, which he called the super eight. Uh, so, but he proved, produced it numerically. Not, um, he didn't prove that this was an actual solution, but he did numerical methods uh, on the on the on the ODE, or perhaps on the variational problem, in fact, uh, to produce this as a as a minimum of the action function. And uh, so then people started thinking about, well, here's this could be a class of interesting solutions. You draw a curve, you put a bunch of particles on it, and see if they if there's a solution on that curve with the particles moving around it, parameterized curve, um, moving around it equally spaced in time. So this became, a, ah, I forgot to put the article up on my iPad. So I'm just gonna unshare and share the different, um, Screen. So uh, a guy called Carles Simon at Barcelona, who's a dynamical systems person and uh, nu a numerical analyst, who does a lot of very careful numerics. He was visiting Chancenay for his sabbatical and uh, sat down with his computer and produced a whole slew of possible curves um, in this paper. So here's four, so as we said just now, you couldn't have four on a perfect figure eight because the symmetry would imply collisions, but he's got a perturbed figure eight. So one of the lobes is smaller than the other lobe. And that turns out to be, at least numerically, that like a solution. Here's the one I've just showed you due to Gerver. Here's a, a, a sort of trefoil looking thing with uh, four particles on it. Um, Here's a nice one, which is, which has the, sim, uh, well, some of the symmetry of the figure eight. It's got this horizontal uh, line of reflection, but it's in a different connected component of the loop space. So if you think of all the loops with this, of four particles with this horizontal uh, line of reflection, like this one has, then there are going to be different connected components. And this is, these are two separate connected components. You can, you could see, you could homotopy. If you homotopy this one, this branch out to the left, you're bound to go through in the motion, you're bound to go through a point where there's a collision. So you leave the, the, the loop space we're talking about where there are no collisions allowed. So anyway, so Simo realized that, you know, you can, you can set up any curve. So his approach was, you take some, uh, so any of these curves, they're, they're closed curves. So it's described by a periodic motion, periodic function from, on, of T from zero to one. So you can write it as Fourier series. So you take however many terms in your Fourier series you think is appropriate. Uh, he took several thousand, I think, usually. And, uh, and then you, you work out the action function and then you decrease the action function by perturbing the coefficients on your Fourier series until you reach something like a minimum. 
And then you think, well, you probably found a solution, but it's only numerical. It's not a theorem that's proved. And these are all the results of his, uh, of his analysis. And almost all of them have some symmetry. This one here, it's a nice one I like. Uh, it's got a reflection left to right. This one has reflections and rotations, so it's got the symmetry of the square uh, with five particles on it. So uh, it's natural to ask, at least this is the question that Katie and I were asking, was, well, what possible symmetries could, can arise? So um, if I come back to my talk now. Uh, is that right? Um, so, so this is the trouble with these iPad apps, they don't do, um, you have to scroll each time you want to bring up the next bit of the slide. So um, the definition of a choreography is uh, a loop, not necessarily a solution to the differential equation, just a loop where each of the uh, each of the particles goes. So the, the basic loop is um, ah, why isn't it giving me the oh? I forgot to change my screen sharing. Sorry. Share again. Can we see it? Here it comes. Right, sorry. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, this is the path like I was talking about before in this, in this configuration space and uh, we assume no collisions. So a choreography is uh, uh, a motion, one of these paths. So there's a fundamental curve in the plane with uh, each of the particles being on the same curve, delayed by each delayed by one nth, if there are n particles, one nth compared to the, the next particle. So what's the symmetry of this? Uh, system. So the symmetry we have uh, having fixed the center of mass at the origin, because you just translate the whole thing and it doesn't make any difference. So uh, we, we just, we have rotations and reflections about the origin, O2, permutations of the particles, because they're all identical, and time translations. So if you think of the figure eight, if you could move a, th a third of the period, then, it, then the, there's a permutation of the particles. Particle one would go to where particle two is, two would go to where three is, and three would go back to where particle one is. So that's a time translation combined with a permutation. So the action of the uh, symmetries are the obvious thing. If you write down actions of groups, um, I won't label that one. So, uh, uh, and of course the loop has some symmetry group. Sigma means it's fixed by that group. So the, the action of an element gives you the same uh, loop. So in particular, the choreography condition, which was that each of the particles are following the same curve with a, with a time delay, uh, can be written as a symmetry element, an element of this group. So uh, the identity, permutation, cyclic permutation, one, two, three, up to n, and a phase time change of one nth of a period. Period is one overall. So that just says, so if they're fixed by this transformation, it just says that each, each particle is following. So Z1 follows Z2, Z2 follows Z3, and so on, in, uh, with a one over n delay. Um, so the question that, that arises about understanding the symmetry groups is um, to, to 
find symmetry groups. So a symmetry group is a subgroup of the full symmetry group, O2 across the permutation, um, the symmetric group across S1 hat. So the hat, so time translations and the hat means you can reverse time as well. So if we think of the figure eight motion, if you could picture it, uh, Z1 at the, was at the left-hand end and it was going up. If you reverse time, it would be going down, so, which is just the reflection. So that would be a symmetry, which is time reversing here and a reflection in here. So we want symmetry groups that contain this choreographic symmetry. In other words, the curve is a choreography and contained in the full symmetry group, of course. So I don't want to go lengthily, uh, we, I have several slides about how the classification works, but I don't want to go into too many details there. Um, but the analysis is based on doing the projection. This was the key, the key point in, in doing this analysis was to look at the projection of this into the time factor. Um, so if, if this map is injective, then of course the group sigma Symmetry group is isomorphic to the image, which is a sub finite subgroup of S1 hat. So it's e which is uh, so S1 hat symmetries of the time circle. It's the same as O2, really. It's just I didn't want to call it O2 because we've got O2 acting spatially. Um, so it's finite subgroup of O2. So it's either cyclic or dihedral. So if it's injective, then then this is either cyclic or dihedral. So that gives us quite a lot of uh, information. And if it's not injective, um, yes, yeah, so those are the details I won't bother going to through. I accept to say that um, we have uh, motion on um, polygons. So there's a rotational aspect to the symmetry and polygons are classified by, the, by their Schleifli symbol. Um, so K slash L is the usual Schleifli symbol. Uh, so if we look back at this motion, for example, has four particles and it's got uh, Six-fold symmetry, um, and if you look each, let me slow it down a bit. So if we take this green, the uh, right two ones going around the top, that green one's going around the top, and then following that green one, it then goes one to the left, and then it'll go around the next lobe on the left, and so on. So it's going around the vertices of a hexagon, taken in order. But if one takes a different, uh, here's six going around a, a pentagon, but it's going not from each vertex to the next vertex, but two further on. So if you know the Schleifli symbol language, this, is, this would be uh, K slash L. K would be five because it's a pentagon, slash L is two. So it'd be five slash two because, which is, if you can see that written in the in the blue highlighted area here, five slash two because it's every other every other vertex. So that's basically the the classification when uh, this map um, this projection tau is injective. Um, I'll come back to that. Um, <clears throat> but if if tau is not injective, then it's got a kernel, which you can show without difficulty is a cyclic group. So you get um, a direct product or semi-direct product really of, of a cyclic group, the kernel with the image, which is also cyclic or dihedral. Um, so you can get, um, slightly more complicated uh, list of classification. So uh, here's the main, here's the theorem, the, the classification. I'm not gonna go into what all the, all the things mean. It's 
it's easier to look at the examples, um, I think. So essentially this means you've got cyclic symmetry with uh, the N here means the number of particles, K slash L is uh, that they're moving on a K fold, a K gon, with Schleffli symbol K slash L. So for five slash two would be a pentagram, five slash one would be a pentagon, for example. If L is one, we don't usually bother writing it down. And then like all the best classifications, there are exceptional cases. So in these two, when you do a rotation, uh, you preserve the orientation of motion of the curve. And if you do a reflection, then reflections reverse the orientation of the curve. But there are some cases like the figure eight, for example. So if we take the figure eight, uh, and we do a reflection in the vertical line. Oh, can't draw on this. Um, so imagine a vertical line down the middle and you reflect from left to right. It's a reflection, but it preserves the orientation of the curve. So those are the exceptional ones and there aren't very many of those. And they only work for odd numbers of particles. Um, if you have one of those symmetries and an even number of particles, then there's going to be necessarily going to be collisions. So there are, for, for when, when the number of particles is odd, there are three exceptional symmetry groups. So this one's the figure eight. Uh, so that's the, that's the, um, the classification theorem. So I think mostly the interest in fact was not what the classification theorem is, but that one could classify all the possible symmetry groups. Um, yes, let me go back and show another one here. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, they, they're quite mesmeric. Uh, my wife actually wanted to see if we could actually build one of these and patent it and uh, use it as uh, for helping babies go to sleep. So stick it at the bottom of their, if they're caught and uh, hopefully lull them into sleep. Anyway, couldn't figure out how to make one. But if you notice this one, if I stop it at any instant, there's a rotation of order five, which maps together with the permutation, it maps the configuration to itself. And that happens at any instant. Right. So it maps the five orange ones to each other and five green ones to each other. So uh, at every instant, there's a, a, a cyclic group of symmetries of order five. And this is what I was saying about when this projection to the time mode, time uh, set of symmetries, um, of the time circle uh, is not injective. So for every time, this, for every instant time, for fixed time, there are symmetries of the configuration. Whereas usually that's not true. So if we go back to um, figure eight, That doesn't have any symmetry at most, you know, for, except for very specific configurations. At certain instants, it has some symmetry, but generally speaking, it doesn't have any symmetry in the in the configuration. And this is one of the exceptional ones because it has a rotational symmetry about the center. And, uh, but that rotational symmetry reverses the direction of motion. It has no reflectional symmetries, only the rotational one. But there's no proof that this, exact, uh, this actually exists as a solution. One has to do some analysis about collisions or, or, or think of some new approach. 
Hmm. So the other interesting question, after having after knowing all the symmetries, is as I referred to earlier, there were certain configurations where there was more than one solution with that particular symmetry. So let's look at a couple of other ones. So here are six particles on a, a curve with fourfold symmetry. And here's another one. So these, these two solutions that I've just shown you have the same symmetry group. Um, this one also. Assuming they exist as solutions. But anyway, these motions have uh, the same, all, all these four have the same symmetry group but there are different connected components of, of the loop spaces, the set of loops with this given symmetry. So how does one classify or talk about the different uh, um, connected components? So give, choose one of these symmetry groups and analyze this connected components of the set of loops with this particular symmetry. So we've done that, Katie and I, for the cyclic ones, not for the dihedral ones. Uh, yeah. Um, so the general story is, um, we've got a group acting on a manifold. We've got a set of loops, uh, which are maps from S1 into M and so we've got, uh, if we take maps from S1 into M, we've got an act, a given action of the group on M and we've got action of S1 on S1, just rotation of the circle. And so for any group sigma in, in G cross S1 that acts on this space of loops, we've got all the loops in M with symmetry sigma. So what are the, what are the, uh, um, connected components of this space. So I'm sure any self-respecting topologist could sit down and scribble about on the back of an envelope and figure it out because we know that the basic story is that the connected components of the loop space correspond to conjugacy classes in the fundamental group, right? So we just have to adapt that statement to, uh, to the set of symmetric loops. And so the way to do that is to define the Rhodes group. So does anybody know Frank Rhodes from Southampton? I believe he was a topologist. I did meet him actually. Do people know Frank Rhodes? Did you know Frank, Roger, Martin? Yeah, I've heard of him, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, so I gave this talk in Southampton. I know a couple of the young, younger topologists who invited me down there and word got round to him that I was talking about the Rhodes group. I put it in the abstract, mentioned it because I knew he was from Southampton. So I thought it might uh, be interesting for people to know that uh, I was talking about something to do with Frank Rhodes. And uh, so he appeared, uh, seemed to be fit and well anyway. Uh, so we had a little chat. It was nice to meet him. Anyway, so so this group, so he was interested in analyzing uh, sort of fundamental groups of orbit spaces. For if you have a finite group G acting on a manifold, what's the fundamental group of M over G? So his starting point was to define this group, which I denote pi one upper G. So it's a set of pairs gamma, which is a path in M based at X. So we're talking about basing it at X and a gamma and an element G of the group. So the path is based at X, but gamma one, gamma of one, instead of being back at X again is at GX. 
and uh, you mod out by uh, the obvious equivalent homotopy relation of fixed fixed endpoints, homotop the path as you like. Um, so this is a nice group, and it's got uh, some not quite obvious, but uh, once you've seen it, it's clear uh, law of composition. Um, so, um, and there's, a, there's an obvious projection. If you take a pair gamma G and you project down to G, then the kernel is, well, G is the identity, so it's just ordinary loops, showing that, the, that this Rhodes group contains the fundamental group as a, um, as a normal subgroup. But the, the the little theorem we proved was that um, if sigma is, is a given finite subgroup of G cross S1, and the map from sigma down to S1 is injective, then sigma is cyclic, uh, generated by some element G in the group. Uh, G comma, whoops, that should say G, G is in G cross S1. So it's G, together with some uh, S1 element. Um, so then the, the story is that the, the phi zero of this uh, space of symmetric loops is instead of conjugacy classes of pi one in itself, it's conjugacy classes for pi one in beta inverse of G. So beta was the projection of uh, pi one G down to the group by taking the second component here. So it's a, it's a coset, it's a coset of pi one. Pi one is beta inverse of the identity element. So instead of taking beta inverse of the identity element, we take beta inverse of G and look at pi one conjugacy classes in, in this space. So, so that gives a, a, a way of enumerating the connected components of um, symmetric space of symmetry loops. In in the case of choreographies, um, we have so the manifold M is this configuration space of n particles in the plane, which is well known that the pi one is the pure braid group, and for the action of the permutation group, the, the Rhodes group is then the, the full braid group. And if we take sigma to be, for example, one of the ones, one of these cyclic groups in the in the um, uh, in the classification, then uh, So we've got, uh, let me just write down, we've got the pure braid group is uh, contained in the full braid group and the quotient is Sn. And the symmetry element you're interested in that generates uh, this particular type of symmetry group, it's a cyclic group, uh, has um, the component in, 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 the, in the symmetric group is what counts. So the set of, uh, of connected components is, is conjugacy classes in the coset of a braid times Pn. So that's a, a coset of the pure braid group inside the braid group. And the actual and the braid element is anything which maps to the generator of, of this given symmetry group. So you can work it out in principle. Why did you know enough about the braid group and how the uh, conjugacy classes in the braid group? So some of that is uh, just straightforward conjugacy classes of, of the of the pure braid group, and some of them, depending on what the 
symmetry group was. Um, for some of these exceptional ones, you get twisted conjugacy classes. So, um, so one knows the connected components of these classes of symmetric loops of these choreographies. And then you can say a little bit more in the case, which is the case here, if, if we've got the group acting on the, on the manifold, if M is aspherical, which is the case here, then components of the symmetric loops are also aspherical. And their fundamental groups are, as you might expect, centralizers given by a commutation condition. So pi one of this will be, uh, yeah, will be the set of pure braids, um, isomorphic to the set of pure braids, which commute with the given braid coming from this, generating this, uh, this symmetry. Oh no, sorry, a braid representing the point gamma. This is a connected component, a connected component containing a particular path gamma. Pi one of this will be pure braids that commute with um, a braid representing gamma. So, but um, I haven't seen enough in the literature about, uh, about these possible, uh, these commutators, what they look like. So an interesting question uh, from the point of view of this um, variational calculus is, okay, so uh, this is, we, we, so we know the topology of this connected component because it's aspherical and pi one is this, it's a K pi one space. Uh, so the critical points of this action function, which is what, what we're interested in, can be given, assuming they're non-degenerate, could be given by Morse theory, if we know the homology of the space. So one would like to know the homology of this commutator subgroup. And, uh, or possibly, if you don't know that the critical points are non-degenerate, then you'd need the lustenich schnirelmann invariant uh, to give you a low bound on the number of critical points. The difficulty being applying that sort of analysis is you would have no way of being able to show that uh, these critical points avoid collisions. It's delicate enough for the minimum. But if you start talking about critical points which are not minima, then they could well be collisions. Um, so one other point I'd, I, I'd like to make, that there's something that people have studied since Poincaré, which is called the strong force. So uh, the standard Newtonian force is inverse square law. So it, um, Poincaré noticed that if you include, if you have an inverse cube law or higher power, then all motions involving a collision will have infinite action. So you can exclude them immediately. So you don't need to worry, you don't need to do any further analysis and estimate all what happens with collisions. You know that the action is infinite. And so the minimum and any other critical point is actually achieved on every, on each individual connected component. Um, so you can prove theorems without any, any work. All the work is in the topology now and not the analysis. So if you assume a strong force um, and all the particles are identical, then for each of the symmetry group and on each connected component, there is at least one collision-free choreography. And if you know the, uh, you might know that there are, um, if you know the fundamental group of, of this connected component using the braid analysis, then um, you could you can estimate using Morse theory or just an neuron and you could get more information if anybody was interested. Okay, I think that's it. Well, thank you very much, James. It's um, it's a long time since I heard the words Lustenich Schnurman. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's good to to hear old friends again. Um, well, um, are there any questions? I I have. If you oh, go ahead, oh. Dale. 
No, you go ahead, Lou. I'll, I'll All right. Um, suppose you put down a smooth plane curve, some arbitrary one. What yeah. do you know about uh, the uh, motion of points along the, cur along the curve? So you a priori constrain the particles to move on the curve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you'll, I, I never thought about it, but I'd be pretty sure you'd get, uh, you'd get a solution. Um, Possibly with collisions. And then one would like to know for an arbitrary curve when there would be no collisions for yeah, endpoints yeah. Well, on I guess, it. Yeah, I wonder. I mean... I guess it's unlikely. I think the particles would tend to be spread out to get a minimum if you're constraining the curve. So you fix a curve. And uh, so these collisions are going to happen. Uh, so if we look at this dynamic that's going here, you can see some that are almost collisions. They're just avoided collisions. So if you deform the curve a little bit, you get collisions by particles that are quite far apart. So um, if you, if you, I suppose most interesting curves would have crossings. And so you'd have to make sure that the collisions don't happen at those crossings. Uh, but you're unlikely to get collisions occurring when the particles are close in the parameter space. But they might be close in the geometric space because of intersections of self intersections of the curve. And you don't know a priori. I mean, the problem, the question would be, what would be the parameterization that would correspond to the solution of the particles? You know, how would they move in time? Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't start with a parameterized curve. You'd start with a, a geometric curve. And uh, yeah, uh, I don't, yeah, that's an interesting question. I've never, never thought about it. Thank you. Thanks. I have a couple of questions. You're, you're assuming the center of mass is fixed. Yeah. Why, why is that true? Well, that's a basic theorem uh, in, in classical mechanics is that, uh, so Newton proved that, uh, actually Galileo showed that, uh, or, or understood that a particle moves uh, with constant velocity unless acted on by an external force. So uh, if you have a bunch of particles together, it's a theorem, you have to do a, a calculation, but if you have a bunch of particles together, then the center of mass moves uniformly, unless there's an external force. And now if you put yourself in the frame of motion of that center of mass, uh, that's uh, a sort of um, an allowed transformation, uh, uh, doesn't change the it doesn't change the mechanics of the interactions of the particles if you put yourself in a uniformly rotate uh, uniformly moving frame constant velocity so you might as well just sit on the center of mass and watch everything move so that's okay. how you reduce to having the center of mass at the origin just by sitting there now how stable are these configurations that is a good question so uh, the figure eight is known to be stable. So the figure eight, where the three particles go around in a, in a figure eight, yeah. that Chancenier and Montgomery proved the existence of, that is known to be stable, but by very subtle arguments, Kolmogorov, Arnold, Moser theorem, uh, yeah. which, which uh, yeah, show that they're, they're stable. But it's generally believed that all the other ones are unstable. Um, even the Lagrange solution, where you put the three on an equilateral triangle, three equal masses, that's unstable. Um, so there are some theorems. So there's a guy, Dan Offin, in, uh, in Queens, in Ontario, who has some theorems about when you have a minimum, so it's not as general as this, there, there are some criteria and I can't remember exactly what they are, but when you have a minimum of the variational problem, it's not stable. So that's not universally true because the figure eight is a counterexample to that the statement as I've stated it, but it's certainly true under a large class of examples. Uh, whenever you minimize the action, 
So a minimum feels like it's a stable thing, but unfortunately, dynamically, it's not. And it's something to do with the fact that the, 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 the thing you're minimizing is kinetic minus potential, which is what Lagrange invented, the Lagrangian, whereas the energy is kinetic plus potential. And so if you have a minimum of kinetic plus potential, then it's stable. But if you have a minimum of kinetic minus potential, it might not be. And um, so I generally believe that, so it certainly proved that, uh, that by Dan Off in, in particular, but other people, that, uh, these, that several of these are, are unstable. Uh, it's known the figure eight is stable and it's assumed or presumed that others are likely unstable. I think the figure eight is the only one that's known to be stable. Okay, an another question. If you have n particles, why do they have to all stay on one curve? Couldn't you have several components of curves and still have them interacting? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. So um, I haven't done the an analogous analysis for the symmetry groups that you get in that case, but um, So there was a Chinese guy, no, Korean, Chinese, I forget, Chen, who, uh, who analyzed a few examples. So you could imagine an, uh, a, a, a sort of horizontally oriented ellipse with two particles going around it and a vertically oriented ellipse with two particles going around it. So that if you do a rotation from the horizontal one to the vertical one, you do a change of time by a quarter of a period, I think. Uh, so that would be a case in point. And he proved using the same sort of analysis about collisions and avoiding collisions by, by, by uh, analyzing this action functional. Uh, he proved that such solutions do exist. Um, yeah. I mean, the solar system is an example, isn't it? Well, yeah, so... Yeah. <clears throat> so you could, stable, so Roger. the solar system has... A, N particles all going around. They're, they're not all equal particles. <laughs> They've actually... I mean, I was wondering, I mean, the Lagrangian solution is unstable. So what would happen if you sort of perturb the masses slightly um, and obviously change the, the, the triangle? I mean, would there be solutions like that or would it... Well, change? actually... Yeah, that, so that's a good question. So actually what Lagrange proved, which is, I think is just absolutely remarkable, is that it's always an equilateral triangle, whatever the masses are. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, and you can see them in space. So you have very different masses. Take the Sun, Jupiter, and look, at, look for the equilateral triangle in the plane of motion of Jupiter, the, the ecliptic. There are... Um, Roger. Meteor, asteroids. no, what do you call them? Asteroids. Asteroids, yes, the asteroids. And they call the Trojans and the Greeks. So the Trojans, I forget now which way around it is, the Trojans leads, lead Jupiter as it goes around the sun. And the, and the other one, the, the Greeks, followed Jupiter as it goes around the sun. So the, but there, there's a region. So when the masses are very different, it's stable. There's a critical mass ratio of the two larger particles where the third one is either stable or unstable. And when the two masses are sufficiently different, like the sun and Jupiter, uh, how big Jupiter is, the sun is just a lot bigger. Uh, it makes this third point of the equilateral triangle a stable point. And so you do get these asteroids conglomerating around there. So there's a whole slew of asteroids uh, at each of the two vertices of the equilateral triangles in the plane. Those would be the Lagrangian points. Yeah, yeah, and they're called Lagrange points. Yeah. So if you if you if you Google uh, L four and L five asteroids, you'll find all sorts of information. Well, that's fascinating. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, you want to say something? There's a stable Lagrange point behind the moon. Yeah. Planting this this space uh, this web telescope there, yeah. Uh, and if you there's some remarkable 
uh, animations of its orbit um, on some various NASA websites. If you just Google web telescope orbit, uh, you'll find some nice pictures. Yeah, so that's what that's the Earth Moon system, Earth Moon satellite. Yeah. Uh, so that's the three body problem. Somehow the sun doesn't, it's not worried by the sun, it just follows the sun, it just follows the Earth Moon system around. Uh, there's also the Earth, the, the Sun Earth system. So the, these three, so there's the Earth, Moon, and then satellite. So that's one of the Euler configurations because it's three masses in a straight line. And they're all, so there are, there are three positions for the third mass. But if you fix two of them, the third one could be at one extreme in the middle or at the other extreme. So that gives you, they're called L1, L2, and L3 because they're all together, they're called Lagrange points, even though Euler discovered the, the collinear ones. So that you've got these, these three collinear Lagrange points. And then there are two Lagrange points, which are numbers four and five, forming the equilateral triangle. And if you think of the talking of artificial satellites, the Earth, Sun Earth system, there's a point between the two where there's an equilibrium, but it's not stable. Uh, and they sent the satellite, was it called Helios, to that point to observe the um, to observe the sun. Hence, it was called Helios. Uh, and the remarkable thing is they can get these satellites back. Uh, the, the, the understanding now of the topology of the dynamical system of the, the three body problem, but also involving the other planets. So how did they get this back? They took advantage of the fact, I mean, one of the problems with, with these satellites is using fuel. And uh, so if you, if you send a satellite and it's in a stable position, it's very hard to get it out again. But if it's an unstable position, you make sure it's close to the, not too close, but close enough to where the unstable solutions, the, the solutions that depart. So eventually, so this, this, this satellite was orbiting around the equilibrium point and eventually it would get to a point where it would flip away and by very minute little bits of uses of fuel, it, they could steer it at crucial moments um, and get it to go round, flip round the back of Mars, I think, and land in the middle of the Nevada desert. I, it, it's incredible, sorry? There are things called heteroclinic points, I think. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where you can control with, yeah. with, with minimum cost. Oh. Yeah, exactly. That's fascinating. Yeah. Your, um, uh, the imagery that you presented uh, is related to the imagery that I saw as I was reading this Quanta article about advances in floor homology by these two researchers at Columbia University. And I wonder if there's, if you've seen that article. I um, haven't, no. Um, it's in Quanta magazine. The other thing is, instead of a baby pacifier, that would be a marvelous uh, Christmas decoration, and there's always yeah. more money in Christmas decorations. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, we're all desperate. We, at a certain age, we're all desperate for baby pacifiers as well. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, oh, grandchildren. I still haven't figured out how to make one. Sorry? Grandchildren in my case. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, well, maybe LED, LED technology would make it a bit more easy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it was, yes. Amongst all of those different pictures, animations, the, the, that one, I think, with the five that rotated, yeah. was somehow very, very appealing. And, right. Yeah, esmeric. Well, I, I mean, I've got a thousand more questions, but I, <laughs> I think this could go on forever and ever. So uh, I, I just thank James um, for, for a really nice talk. Um, can I say that uh, Sam's talk uh, last week, was, um, the sound was, was, was horrible. So Sam is giving the talk again on Thursday at 6 p.m. London time. Um, Lou's, uh, is that right, Lou? Uh, of course. And uh, if you can't make it to that, um, it'll be recorded. We'll, we'll 
Let me uh, give you the um, meeting uh, um, code for that meeting. Just a second. You're still recording, Roger. I don't know if that's useful. Oh, yeah, perhaps not. 